Okay, hello everyone. I'm here with Professor Hans Jörg Moller. You may be familiar with his work um, from the Carefree Wandering YouTube channel or from uh, his books, including a book uh, just released uh, on the topic of profilicity. Um, Professor, how are you doing today? Not too bad. Thanks awesome. for having me in your show. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, would you mind first, before um, getting into the philosophical issues, uh, telling us a little about yourself, your journey through philosophy, and what brought you to Macau? My uh, academic background is in Chinese studies, sinology, focusing mostly on early Chinese philosophy, especially Taoism. And I did this for many years, um, originally in Germany. Um, and then uh, I, st I, start, I took on a few teaching positions, uh, the first one in Canada, uh, which was already in philosophy. So then I switched from Chinese studies to philosophy. And then in Ireland, the University College Cork. And then in 2015, uh, I came to the University of Macau. And um, the reason that I came to Macau, there are various reasons for this. Uh, number one, academically, it made sense for me because I'm doing Chinese and comparative philosophy. And so Macau is a place situated historically, culturally, right between the East and the West. And so um, the university and the whole city is kind of dedicated to this kind of East-West um, how to say, um, exchange. And so mm -hmm. um, also our department is, is very much focused on uh, this area that is my academic background. Um, in addition to that, uh, I didn't like the Irish weather anymore after six years mm -hmm. in Ireland, which is actually true. It kind of gets depressing there, not really having mm -hmm. any summer and having very extended periods without basically sunlight uh, oh, wow. because uh, it's uh, always rainy and overcast not always but very often uh, and uh, so that was the reason and um, uh, yeah and I always liked Macau very much as a city it's kind of was my dream since I came here the first time in the late 1980s uh, and um, I was fascinated by the city because of its Mediterranean flair, the old Portuguese element mm. is still very strong. And um, so, yeah, and um, I'm, I, I always liked, liked the city. So that was also an important reason for me. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. So did you, I, I guess uh, it makes me wonder, did you come to what, uh, be interested in Western philosophy second to becoming interested in Eastern philosophy or... Um, how did... um, simultaneously, uh, my, my minor was philosophy. And um, when, I start, when I studied initially, I wanted to do Chinese literature, but then for various reasons, I switched to Chinese philosophy. I found the ac access to Chinese literature somehow more difficult than access to Chinese philosophy. <laughs> And um, yeah, and then my minor was was philosophy. So there was, a, and it also coincided with my, the interest of my teacher, which is always important, who was also mm -hmm. focusing much more on philosophy than on literature. So but, uh, this simultaneously, but there was a strong focus on Chinese philosophy and learning classical Chinese, learning the language I was teaching classical Chinese. Um, for many years, uh, so the, my, my, my prime access to philosophy is through Chinese philosophy. I mm -hmm. like to compare this to someone, whether, whoever, you know, who does classics and studies, whatever, Greek and Latin, and through that avenue gets an access to philosophy. And it was kind of similar in my case, mm -hmm. just that I didn't study Greek and Latin philosophy, but uh, Chinese philosophy. It, so... Here, here's a fun question. If there is any, if there was any term in Chinese philosophy specifically that you could introduce to the Western philosophical 
mainstream. Is there any particular linguistic term that stands out to you as particularly useful or? Uh, yes, mm, actually, probably the term that most people would say would be the term Tao, which is the way or the course of nature. Uh, and um, that's maybe the most important term. <laughs> but uh, I think something like a little bit more different, maybe I would like to use not just one term, but the distinction uh, between zhe and luan. Zhe is order and luan is disorder. And um, I think this distinction between order and disorder is really central to particularly early Chinese philosophy. Uh, uh, that is kind of, a, in my, just to make a very general comparative statement, such comparative statements are always problematic because they're yeah. overgeneralizing. But uh, anyways, uh, certainly in early Greek philosophy and, and Western philosophy in general, and throughout the history of Western philosophy, the distinction between truth and appearance has been very central, right? Mm -hmm. Philosopher is the, is the person who, unlike the rest of the people is capable of, of seeing the difference between truth and appearance. That's, that's a I, major Plato theme. I, Plato, am the truth. Yeah. And I mean, through the, 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 this is still until today, right? I mean, that's uh, somehow what a philosopher is supposed to be an expert in. Uh, in China, the, the philosopher, like the job definition of the philosopher is someone who knows what, or, what order is as opposed to disorder and who can... Uh, especially in the early Chinese philosophical context, uh, be like an advisor to the government and help uh, help society to to um, be orderly rather than rather than disorderly. So I think this distinction between zhe and luan, between order and disorder, is really formative for Chinese philosophy. And also the notion of tao, uh, the the way or the path, is directly connected to this because it indicates an orderly process, an orderly functioning, right? Like the course of nature, why, the, the important thing about the course of nature is that it is orderly, right? Uh, that, it, uh, that it is productive and through being orderly, is, is productive through being orderly, right? Whatever the, 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 the sequence of the seasons and so forth, an order of time, an order of space, uh, all these things uh, like the heavenly bodies are seen as somehow ordered. And so there's this order in nature. Uh, and um, that's the Tao. Well, it's, of course, a process order. It's not just a static order. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I think that the, the notion of Tao has to be understood in direct connection mm -hmm. with this notion of order versus disorder. Yeah, Tao is such a it's such a central concept that it's almost hard to branch off from there until you you get that that bit of it. But that's that's interesting. I haven't heard um, those. I, I'm somewhat familiar with Chinese philosophy, and I hadn't heard those terms given. But now thinking about it, reading the Lao Tzu, for example, um, you know the common sort of uh, pop philosophy. Uh, engagement with Lao Tzu sees him as, oh, that's the guy who writes about letting go and um, mm. just go with the flow and all of that. Right. Um, but so much of what he writes is is exactly what you said of putting, letting the natural order uh, take its course, so to speak. It's exactly. not just sort of um, just uh, giving into randomness. It's trusting in the order of nature. Exactly. Um, yes. Do you see maybe how how does that compare with the Western concept of logos uh, or Tao, which you were talking about earlier with Tao? Do you think they're comparable terms? There have been uh, comparisons about this, and uh, I think uh, and, and and these comparisons are how to say warranted. They 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 make sense. Um, what we do have in logos, also as we use the term today is a much stronger intellectual emphasis, an emphasis on the intellect there, right? And that, of course, then we have like Tao as kind of, you know, uh, then we have God as the intelligent designer. And um, it's, again, it's not like a black and white distinction. It's not that this is totally absent from Tao. There's also some form of intelligence associated with it. But um, nevertheless, uh, I think there's much clearer emphasis on logos, and then this leads to the notion of God and the notion of intelligent design and 
um, that is, um, there, there's a much stronger emphasis on, on, on intelligence, on intellect, on the spirit uh, than, than you have in the Chinese context of Tao. Especially, yeah, when you think about the book of, of John, I believe it is, where it opens with, in the beginning, was the word or the logos. Exactly. And yes. the word was with God and the word was God. I, I'm right. thinking, though, um, where I've noticed maybe a parallel uh, with how the term is used is with Heraclitus. Um, right. Uh, because he talks about the logos as sort of this natural order. Um, and so those two figures always sort of fascinated me yes. um, because they seem like two sides of the same coin in, in some respect. Yes. Um, yeah. There are lots of parallels between Heraclitus and, uh, and Lao Tzu and Taoism. I mean, Heraclitus, the first parallel is that uh, the texts are very uh, hermetic and uh, they, they are open to so many different interpretations. But uh, generally, I mean, the emphasis on process again, on change, um, uh, uh, but many other things that they are they are kind of similar Heraclitus and Lao Tzu. There's a lot of potential, and there has been a lot of uh, um, comparative work on this. Interesting enough, if you look at this, because I, I mean, your your background is basically Nietzsche a lot, right? Mm. And then Heraclitus has been influenced. Uh, Nietzsche has been influenced a lot by Heraclitus. Uh, so, uh, and I think that's also a reason why. Uh, there is a certain affinity between even Nietzsche and Chinese philosophy. And the link is, I think, through Heraclitus. I, I perceive that as well. I remember when I first picked up some Chinese philosophy, I was sort of wondering why it, it uh, seemed to jive with what I'd read in Nietzsche so much. And I think, I think you're onto something uh, there. But so I wanted to, to ask you to sort of... Uh, shift well it's a related topic because heraclitus you know of course he writes he's this philosopher of becoming um rather than seeing reality in terms of the static categories of being and so one of the ways that nietzsche seems to read heraclitus is that he um what would you say uh, because he if you compare him to say parmenides or the other a lot of the other pre-socratic greeks they see in that two worlds distinction you brought up earlier, truth and appearance, the truth is this undivided substance and appearance is what changes. Whereas with Heraclitus, right. uh, the, the change is the very fabric of being, so to speak, or well, right. I just use the word being, but um, I think you, you get my meaning. And so right. one of the interesting videos that you did was on Hegel and the sort of emancipation of appearance and I guess I just wanted to ask you about that because Hegel has always been sort of a blind spot for me, but the description you gave of how he uh, reconfigures our view of the phenomenal world seemed to me to be of the kind with that sort of approach to epistemology. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on the, the way that Hegel um, accomplishes this shift. Yeah, uh, I, there is a strong element, again, also of Heraclitus in Hegel, and uh, it's precisely uh, this element that you just described. And again, that's also how, um, how uh, Hegel connects later on with Nietzsche, right? I, I think that is the, the main axis, the kind of, the, do you say red thread? Do you say this yeah. in English? You say it in German, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that runs through it. And um, uh, Hegel uses the term uh, Erscheinung, which is in itself ambiguous, much more ambiguous than the English term appearance, because the English term appearance is basically mostly negative. Uh, but Erschein I mean, appearance has the same uh, ambiguity, but um, maybe not as strong as in German where the Erscheinung also has like in English also to appear means to you know to appear on this on stage or something like this right so it also has this positive meaning right or there appears a new whatever uh. age or something uh, but in German this Erscheinung is even I would say the, 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 the positive connotation is as strong as a negative connotation or maybe even stronger uh, because it has the moment of shine uh, in it right which is a very 
very positive idea and that connects with Hegel's theology actually right so the idea that Jesus is God that appears on earth mm. right that's uh, the again it's a kind of Heraclitus move that uh, what actually the, the 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 kind of the everlasting eternal truth only really matters when it is temporalized and becomes a temporal human being in time and space. And there, this is this this is, I think, where the notion of Erscheinung for Hegel comes from. From uh, mm. it's from his theological background, right? That God appears, shines on earth, so that it is the eternal that de-eternalizes itself and temporalizes itself. I think that's the core idea for, for Hegel. And that only through this temporalization uh, and uh, through this appearance and shining is, so to speak, God does God become real, become virtuous, becomes working, right? becomes active. So, so uh, it is, otherwise, you would say it is, oh, sorry, just to ask uh, briefly, hmm, go ahead. you would say it is in, in Hegel, it's through appearance that, things become real that yes. uh, only through okay. their reality is only in appearance real reality otherwise would it's you not real would you say that hegel would then sort of reject the kantian noumenon or yes i think that's and that he makes this heraclitic heraclitic kind of move right that uh um, it is really what counts is the is the actual temporal appearance and not the the noumenal on its own. I mean, you have that in Kant as well. Now we become, we get very te technical, right? Because also for Kant, the thing on sich, right, the, the thing in itself is is in, inaccessible. So it's something that philosophy can uh, acknowledge, but actually doesn't deal with. Right, and because it's yeah. beyond the limits, uh, and um, so, for, but for Hegel, this becomes much, much stronger. That that the, the thing in itself, or the numinal and so forth, is not something that um, that we just you know assume and then somehow don't really touch. But it is something that becomes very much um, that becomes very much real and concrete. The, the truth is like, right. This concretization, that's very, that's what, that what, that's what really counts. And that is the essence of the, uh, of this kind of luminal is only seen and is only there and is only real virtually in its appearance. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it, it also somewhat reminds me of, uh, the, the Zhuangzi as well. Um, and the whole, uh, because it seems like there's this underlying theme that, um, through change or through arising and passing away, that's where you get identity, so to speak. Um, and I don't know, I guess just to, to maybe a final question about all of this, what's interesting to me is that Nietzsche doesn't seem to like Hegel very much just to go back to those two. Um, and what I would base this on, there's just a few unpublished notes where uh, he says, I need to, I, I need something to counter Hegel on this point or that point. And then there's also, well, if, there's Deleuze as well. He sort of reads Nietzsche as rejecting the Hegelian dialectic. Um, and then I guess the other thing would be that Nietzsche's influence from Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer sort of saw himself as an oppositional to Hegel. So it's interesting to me, or I guess kind of a puzzle as to how Nietzsche and Hegel come to the same point, I think, in terms of, um, what would you say, uh, almost, in Nietzsche's case, spiritualizing the world of appearances and the world of phenomena. And as you point out with Hegel, that also comes from his theology. Um, I don't know if you have any... Um, uh, reaction. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the relation between Hegel and Nietzsche, I think, from a scholarly perspective, it's both very simple and very complex. It's simple, I guess, because Nietzsche wasn't really a Hegel scholar, right? And he didn't really right. seriously discuss Hegel's works at all. Uh, so I, he did, he was not really much into Hegel to put it very simple right and yeah. so there's always a distance and he doesn't claim uh, you know to come up with any kind of uh, really informed critique of Hegel that's not there 
but on the other hand, uh, I think he's clearly to use this kind of uh, half Hegelian notion, notion that zeitgeist, the, 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 the spirit of the times, I think he was in this sense, of course, like the whole 19th century, uh, 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 deeply uh, kind of um, influenced by the Hegelian turn in philosophy, which is precisely this turn towards uh, simply put historicity right uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that's uh, the big shift from Kant to Hegel and that's again uh, what is appearance appearance is temporalization you have to see everything how it actually appears shines becomes wirklich becomes actual in time uh, and that's uh, that's a big thing for for Nietzsche, of course, as well. I mean, his focus on history already in his early works, and um, so that's the whole nineteenth century. And I quote Nietzsche writes this multiple times. I quote this in the video: "Without Hegel, no Darwin, right? Because mm -hmm. Darwin also sees life itself, which is, of course, very central for." Nietzsche, the notion of life, maybe the most central notion for Nietzsche, uh, that life itself is not kind of set up in a true everlasting mm -hmm. way by the intelligent designer God, but it is something that evolves, right? And this that's this very similar move that we see with Hegel, right? That everything becomes concrete, is not there from the in its in its evolution, in its evolving. And in, in history, and then, of course, you know, we have this at Marx, uh, in, in the social, uh, like, in a, in a, like how history, how politics, right, is, is essentially his, his, historical, how material production has to be understood from a historical perspective. And we have to understand, so to speak, the laws of history in order to understand what society is and how, what society can be. And then in, in Darwin, we have this to life. And this, this is all, I think, an effect of the, of the Hegelian revolution in philosophy. Uh, and Nietzsche is very much a part of that. Uh, so um, generally, like I said, sometimes the 20th century with Rorty has been like uh, described as the linguistic turn as being focused yeah. on language, right? And similarly, I think the 20th century, the 19th century is, is just, uh, we have this historical turn and everything is somehow now is seen from the perspective and through the perspective of time and history, uh, temporality. Yeah, and that's interesting because it's almost as if he, then Nietzsche would be in the wake of that without even really um, needing yes. to acknowledge it or realize it. Exactly, um, yes. Yeah, it, one of the interesting things from your video- I mean, just on... sorry for interrupting, oh, sorry. Like, um, one of the books, the genealogy, right? The genealogy mm -hmm. is a Hegelian, it, that's that's the Hegelian notion, even morality, right? Even morality, we no longer understand as kind of with Kant, a set of, you know, uh, basically universal categorical laws, but we understand morality from as a genealogy that's the hegelian that's the hegelian move right it, is evolving as through uh off haven is that i'm probably saying that wrong yeah <laughs> but yes yeah. yes um yes and i i definitely see that in in nietzsche as well well and it's interesting because so in the video you did on the sort of relationship between hegel and marx and nietzsche you talked about uh de frolic wissenschaft the yes. whole idea that nietzsche's frolicking science yes. uh, is to take the hegelian idea of uh go from what is contingent to finding what is necessary to going from what is necessary and showing you how it's actually contingent and right. so what i had never maybe heard that framing of it before but it it i really like it because it is um it's you know around that time i think the few books before that he's writing and uh, human all too human about uh, the congenital defect of all philosophers is how they take what's near into their time and place and universalize it uh, to all men at all times. And so there's that sort of that um, side of Nietzsche um, that really comes out during that time where he is very hyper aware of his historical position and how so much philosophy is a recapitulation to a historical perspective. But I'm wondering, um, do you think and I, I would ask this because you've classified Nietzsche as sort of a pre-postmodernist. Do you think with like the idea of will to power or some of those 
central organizing principles that perhaps Nietzsche did have some trans historical ideas um, do, do, or I guess, which do you see as primary? Are his ideas such as will to power um, as the highest sort of organizing value? Is that something that is within Nietzsche's own historical perspective? Does he, is he rolled up into that? Or is, is it like that we have all these different historical perspectives that are sort of um, different refractions or projections of will to power, that there is some sort of trans historical truth. Does that make, make sense? Yes, that's a good point. My former colleague, Günther Wolfert, uh, he classified Nietzsche as post pre-Socratic, pre-postmodernist. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. And, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, I think that combines, that, and that brings us back to what we said earlier. He actually wrote a uh, long book, several hundreds of pages on Nietzsche's reading of B-52, not the airplane, but the fragment of Heraclitus oh, okay. with children playing on the beach. Uh, anyway, so I think that uh, that's uh, that responds directly to your point, right? Because even though Heraclitus is a philosopher, obviously, of change and so forth, nevertheless, there is this very strong kind of metaphysical uh, you know, change is eternal, right? So the, that's, yeah. uh, 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 and is strongly embedded in this kind of early forms of, of early Greek science and, and mathematics and these kinds of stuff. And, and so uh, that is this kind of post, uh, that is this kind of post pre-Socratic is this element in Nietzsche, which is, you know, he was a classicist uh, that mm -hmm. which, has this, um, and then, you know, the great doctrines of, as you say, whatever, like the, the will to power or the eternal recurrence of the same or so. This is all in the style, in a kind of strange post pre-Socratic style, right? Yeah. Uh, he speaks in this way. But then you have also the, all the, the pre-postmodernist thing where, where, where it's actually about, uh, you know, contingency and, and there's no meta narrative again. And so he, I, I think that's a, a, a good, um, a very good kind of um, label that, that uh, Gunther Wolfart uh, came up with, right? That Nietzsche really combines these two elements mm -hmm. and they are, they are exactly the same two elements that you just pointed out. Yeah, he's standing in these sort of two different perspectives. Um, yes. Maybe perhaps on some level he would like to deconstruct everything and then on another level he would like to have his <laughs> edifices as well. Um, exactly, yes. Interesting. Um, so, so I'm glad we, we, we talked about uh, a lot of this with appearances um, first because I'd like to get into your ideas on profilicity, um, which I think if there are those in the audience who haven't heard you talk about this, um, kind of relates to what we've been talking about with uh, the emancipation of appearance in some, in, to some extent. But um, if, if you wouldn't mind giving a, a, I guess, quick outline of what profilicity is um, and how it's come to be this new, this new social technology for identity. Uh, sure. Um, so, Th this uh, notion of profilicity, it's, it's a new term uh, suggested by Paul D'Ambrosio and myself in, in this book, You and Your Profile. And the basic idea is uh, traditionally uh, there, ha there have been two what we call identity technologies or modes of identity. In traditional societies, and this uh, especially in China, it has a lot to do with both Paul and my background in Chinese philosophy and doing Taoism. Uh, there is this mode that we call following Lionel Trilling, uh, sincerity. And sincerity basically means to um, develop a sense of identity uh, you know, the idea of who you are, and then as kind of your existential mode based on roles, on social roles, you orient yourself towards the social roles that you're born into, 
in the Chinese context, but not only in China, uh, all over like the pre-modern world, uh, this was basically family roles as a most, uh, but then many other roles as well, like in military or generally like in politics in society and the economy. Uh, you were born into certain roles, gender roles, family roles, professional roles, religious roles, cultural roles, and so forth. But you were born into them, and then you sincerely commit to them. And if you sincerely commit to them, then you can develop a very strong sense of identity and a whole ethos that comes along with it, right? You dedicate yourself to the values attached to these roles and attached to these identities that orient themselves towards the roles. So that's sincerity. And then this, in, uh, with, the, with the shift towards the modern world, um, there appears a shift again following Lionel Trilling from sincerity towards uh, authenticity. And now the idea is um, all these roles are just somehow external constraints. They are somehow fake. Uh, there's social constructs that um, um, don't really... Um, uh, go to the core of your identity. So now you have to build identity by finding out who you are or by uh, Nietzsche, right? Becoming who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, Nietzsche, of course, also very much uh, uh, influenced by this semantics of authenticity. So the idea is now that identity is uh, to be found in your inner self. And you need to be true to yourself. And this is the only way in which you can establish something like a true identity. And of course, then this also very strongly informs existentialism, both Heidegger and Sartre. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, the central element, I would say, of, of still the, the dominating Western uh, discourses in politics, in psychology, and you name it, right? In art, uh, right? Authenticity is is still um, very dominant uh, semantics, and is, this is this is this is how I th uh, identity is to be found and developed. Uh, now we argue in the book that the time, as the philosopher of Charles Taylor called it, actually the age of authenticity. Uh, is coming to an end and that now we are switching uh, given also or in the context of a, a lot of recent social changes including of course importantly the digital age uh, that we're moving on to a third form of identity construction of uh, a third identity technology that is no longer oriented primarily towards the supposed inner core self uh, but that is oriented toward public profiles. So um, that's why we call it profilicity. It's profile oriented. So you build identity uh, by curating a profile and then being, as we like to call it, truly invested in your profile. So um, you project a certain profile and then this profile gets somehow valid validated uh, in society by what we call the general peer. And then you, uh, this, this has a strong identity value because uh, you're getting invested in it, right? And always the best examples for these are online profiles, online personalities, like you and I both have. I mean, we're, bo we're mm -hmm. both now <laughs> in the mode of profilicity and we're both now building up investment in our profiles, right? What we do right now is like, I'm invested in my media personality and you are invested in your media personality. And this is how we build up uh, uh, our own experience mm -hmm. and uh, of identity. And to an That's increasing nice. degree, oh, sorry, just to interject quickly, to an increasing degree, everyone is, um, a media personality to some extent or another, to the extent that they have social media um, and are projecting exactly, something but through that. Exactly. So, but the social media is the best example for this, but we are stipulating that, that this is already predates social media mm. and that social media are successful because they enable something that has already been there for a while, namely 
pro felicity and this is how the media actually media technology is being used so we would say it is so successful in the way it is because it serves this new form of identity which was already there uh, and um, the best uh, example I like to use to explain the notion of profilicity and also the, how it shapes identity is through the brand. The brand also, of course, predates um, social media, right? It's like, I don't know how old exactly, but about like at least a hundred and something years old when, uh, um, when products were no longer seen when we call first order observation right a shoe is no longer seen as a shoe but it is seen in terms of the brand so products things uh, are being branded uh, and this is how they uh, get an identity so the the basic hypothesis is that that's that's a, that's the earlier form of a profile the brand is the earlier form of a profile and so basically we follow the logic of the branding of things through the profiling of individuals. So, and as you've pointed out, this is not um, something that has entirely overtaken the old ways of building an identity. They can, you no. can have multiple social technologies at the same time. Right. Um, I wanted to ask though, um, what is, maybe this is a, uh, a bit of a basic question, but what is identity itself or, or what is it that all three of those things are doing that warrants the common definition of producing an identity? Right. Um, I mean, our view, which again is uh, strongly influenced as Paul and I, and we both have this background in Taoism and Chinese philosophy, and um, which in turn is, has a Taoism has a strong relation to Buddhism. And so uh, for us, basically identity is um, to put it in Buddhist terms, we don't use this terminology, is kind of the illusion of selfhood. Mm. Uh, so uh, our idea is basically uh, that there is no, that um, uh, human existence is, uh, essentially incongruent, multifarious, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't really have actually an identity in the sense that, you know, um, we consist of very different uh, dimensions, our bodily functioning, our uh, psycho psychological uh, complexity and experience, our, our, uh, the, 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 the evolution of society, with all our different social functions. And they are not in any meaningful sense identical, right? There is no kind of identity that somehow connects all these different uh, levels, dimensions of, of human experience, right? There is no soul, right? And the, uh, uh, right, as in the traditional uh, idea that that is somehow this kind of selfhood. And also, so, but we need a sense of identity in order to, de we need to develop it psychologically. It also has to be there socially. We need to be able to identify one another. So it is an absolutely necessary construct but this construct is difficult to achieve sim simply because again of the of the multifariousness and the incongruity of of human uh, existence and uh, so but we need we need this construct and um, that's that's basically what uh, identity is against all odds against all the odds developing this this sense of identity uh, that we both need as individuals to be able to live in a society to function in the way it functions. So uh, perhaps a, a common objection, well, because you've clarified um, that this is not, that the, the shift over to profilicity, which would follow from most of what you just said, is not a bad thing or that you're not saying that we've somehow become uh, more dishonest or disingenuous. Um, but I think that, and I, and I believe 
Dr. Peterson actually said this in his response to you. Um, many people will have a sort of a, 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 an immediate reaction to that, that on some level, the authentic way of crafting personality is more real. And I think part of that is, you know, the term authenticity, I think sort of means implies realness to us. Like if you, if you have, um, like if you, if you buy a painting and you say, I've got a Jackson Pollock painting, I'm going to get it authenticated. And then you can tell your friends once you've had it authenticated, Hey, this is a real Jackson Pollock. Right. And I think there's a, maybe a linguistic association that there's something, uh, there's something, how, how would I put it? That just basically that view as authenticity is going to be more legitimate than something that is just merely quote unquote superficial or something based on how you're perceived, how you appear to others. Um, I, I guess what I would ask is, is do you see that as a common sort of objection to this idea? And do you see a way of responding to that uh, objection uh, of course, this is a very uh, a central uh, question that uh, both Paul and I have been asking ourselves, not the least because we share the same feeling that you mm-hmm. describe. We are also children of the age of authenticity. So we all feel that authenticity is somehow the real deal. And uh, that's the that's the that's the identity technology that that we've learned and that we grew up in and that that that, that therefore we're not willing to uh let go often not even willing to question mm-hmm. uh so uh that is exactly true i mean uh that is the um, uh, if, but again, I would like to say, and this is again something we get from our, both Paul and I from our exposure to both China and Chinese history and Chinese philosophy, because authenticity is actually a new thing. It wasn't always there. It's very new. You don't really find it in Chinese philosophy or history at all, and not really in in the tradition of Western philosophy either. Uh, and uh, just to give the example, you mm-hmm. used uh, the painting, right? The, that mm-hmm. that painters are personally known, and that uh, you know that you have this kind of unique style. Of, that is also something very new, right? In China, painting was always just copying, right? You learn to paint by by learning to copy better and better, right? And through this, there was eventually also the idea that through copying, you, you know, you, you, you somehow create genius like artwork, but it wasn't really the focus about, you know, the individual authentic being that expresses his or her own authenticity in the painting. That was never the point of painting and uh, painters were not seen in this way. Uh, they were maybe seen as having some form of magical capacity and have cultivated themselves to such a way that they would be being able as in, 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 in traditional Europe, we have the, the notion of meravigliose or the marvelous, that they could produce, that was art was marvelous, but it wasn't authentic. And uh, that's very different, right? And definitely Jackson Pollock, just giving you an example, is not very marvelous, right? It's pure authenticity, but <laughs> yeah. it's kind of a ridiculous, <laughs> uh, uh, it's a ridiculous form of pure authenticity, which has lost all the marvelous. Uh, so uh, that's a very good example. And that shows basically, I mean, uh, how how this how Jackson is an excellent example that you gave up. Thank you. This kind of the distill, distill, distilling authenticity in art. And so we have this switch from what true art is. I don't think in the, in the Middle Ages, anyone, and especially not in Chinese history, oh, my connection. Who art? Did I lose you. Uh, authentic oh. art. Most people would have said that's just like absolutely. I mean, they didn't have the concept. Of, it's insincere. It's right. It's mm. <laughs> why it's not art because it's not sincere. 
So of course we have the perspective of authenticity is how we've learned to build our identity. So we judge everything and we have the whole value system. Other going back to needs, it's a genealogy we have, it's in our genes. It's uh, And that's why this value system for us seems so absolute and we can't even understand how it's questionable. But if you grew up in sincerity and you have sincerity gene, it's not really uh, therefore true. And that lacks identity in that sense. Mm. And now again, like I think we're now in the shift towards profilicity, but we're still, of course, uh, because society is changing and and authenticity is is becoming increasingly the 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 absurdities of authenticity become increasingly obvious, and we increasingly now see. Just following up on the precise example again, the ridiculousness of a Jackson Pollock painting. And we see that it's not authentic, that he was just trying crying fashion and marketing himself as a profile. Jackson Pollock was not authentic. He was just creating the Jackson Pollock profile very successfully. And now we can increasingly see that. And we can see that we need to do exactly the same thing uh, as well, and that we are not authentic. So we're kind of slowly, uh, slowly seeing that the authentic that authenticity is not what it promised to be mm. yeah, that's a very interesting point because uh, as you were saying that thinking about it it really is in terms of what would you say uh, any form of art or expression that ends up being marketed or commodified you immediately sort of call into question the authenticity of it um which, yeah, would definitely suggest that we've been doing, we've had, had this process of transformation going on for mm. quite a long time. Um, I, I guess I just have a few more questions, um, which I guess will go, I'll pivot here to a related issue, which is um, you, something you've talked about, which is the dreaded topic of wokeism. But just the way we're talking about prophylicity, um, a thought, occurred to me when I was watching your video on that topic that I wonder if a lot of the issues that people raise with wokeism now or wokeness or whatever it might be, um, to what extent are they disagreements with the civil religion and to what extent are they disagreements with the pro-felicity element of it? Because if you look, think about that woke CIA ad where she's giving her identity as the box checking exercise, right. or maybe a more straightforward example, people think uh, a lot of uh, there's a lot of to do about virtue signaling. And it seems that right. if as if the issue people have is that it's not authentic virtue, um, more so than the fact that they don't like necessarily maybe maybe they might agree with the underlying ideas of the civil religion but they don't like the prophil prophilic what pro uh, i don't know what how to yeah, how to use it prophilic, as an yeah. adjective prophilic yeah. uh, aspect of it um i guess that's that would be my question is is there maybe is there maybe some like lack of clarity in our mind at the moment when we're engaging with wokeness as to what it is that we're actually um opposing or don't like about or find distasteful about it or um how does this relate to the to the shift to pro felicity? Yeah, I think that's also a good point, and uh, I think everyone experiences this. Um, uh, you know, virtue signaling is a very good expression for you know to see the inauthenticity in the display of authentic morality. Uh, that becomes increasingly obvious again, just as it becomes increasingly obvious that Jackson Pollock uh, was creating a profile when he was mm -hmm. painting, uh, which wasn't obvious at the time. And then the reaction is, oh, we just need to kind of try harder or we just need somehow, uh, you know, uh, preserve the authenticity of that morality. Do, rediscover the lost city of authenticity. Yes, <laughs> but of course that makes the whole thing only more and more obvious, right? If you virtue, if you, if you kind of, uh, you know, try to signal that virtue signaling is not virtuous, then your virtue signaling 
yourself again. We're just living in, if it's in the time and age we're living in, uh, the, it is impossible to uh, be truly authentic because that's not how the whole uh, social setup is, is working. Uh, and then we try harder and it becomes more and more obvious that, that uh, it's, it's not going to work that way. Um, so uh, so I, I don't think uh, it is possible to rescue authenticity. Uh, and I don't think even it's worth rescuing it because, again, I think it's just a technology of producing identity that is n neither bad or worse than the others. Uh, again, um, as you said earlier, and that's always important to also highlight, that doesn't mean that authenticity totally disappears. It's still an element, and that's a Hegelian element, it's Aufhebung, right? Aufhebung has the three meanings, uh, negation, uh, that's, uh, it's no longer, to lift, uh, that is uh, English has a two meaning as well, two meanings of lifting, to lift something, lift the sanctions, they're no longer valid. So authenticity is lifted in that way, it's lifted in that it's going to a higher level, a more advanced, more complex level in this sense. But also in Aufhebung, uh, which is often not understood uh, uh, as a third meaning is maintaining. It's also maintained, paradoxically. It's both negated and maintained. So there are elements um, that uh, in authenticity that, that still remain within profilicity, mm -hmm. but it's, no, it's not possible to have, this, uh, to have this kind of pure authenticity uh, to, uh, again. again. Uh, it, 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 it can be and is an, an important element, but it's no longer the kind of the guiding, uh, the guiding principle. It's somehow integrated in, becomes an element of profilicity, becomes somehow the supporting element of profilicity. And uh, so, yeah, I think society is kind of in the process, and that's interesting to see. I just had a discussion with Paul the other day about this. This would be maybe a future project um, to see this kind of new ethos of profilicity emerging, right? This is, and we don't have it yet. And we, I think we're still desperately mm. searching for this. This is also why we're clinging on to the ethos of authenticity, because the ethos of profilicity hasn't fully developed yet. Um, right. So, as I said earlier, if you think back to the shift from sincerity to authenticity, right, the sincerity, sincerity has a very strong value system attached to it, right, a, a morality and ethos, honesty, mostly, right, dedication mm -hmm. to your roles. Uh, but I mean, this whole honesty thing is like super important. Um, and, you know, whatever, courage and then the, the different virtues that are associated with the different roles, right, whatever the... Uh, the you know the courageous warrior the the the, the faithful wife the um, whatever uh, you know and the dutiful son and the yes all uh, these things yes right. and um, uh, then this totally breaks down and with authenticity and all these things are no longer really valued right uh, they they seem all suspicious and dubious uh, you know and. Um, the 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 the, the susp Nietzsche suspicion, right? We see everything we, we have the suspicion towards this. And now we have this suspicion, as you see in virtue signaling. Virtue signaling is a suspicion of the authenticity of the proclamation of authentic virtue. But we haven't really fully developed the new ethos. This new ethos also in authenticity took a long time to, to develop, right? We have whatever Heidegger and Sartre, right? Sartre still, I was just teaching Sartre in my introduction to Western philosophy class a few weeks ago, and, and you can still see how he still, and this is like in the 1940s, uh, is still kind of very um, under, under, under great difficulties developing an ethos of authenticity because it wasn't really there yet, right? The notion of course, right? Uh, in this kind of emptiness that we are, we have nothing to build on because we're just, you know, these unique individuals and uh, we have nothing to rely on. It's all, you know, despair and forlornness and anguish. And yet we can develop this 
this ethos of responsibility, which, by the way, brings us directly to Jordan Peterson, who you mentioned. <laughs> Jordan Peterson has very much uh, uh, also, of course, this kind of mainstream ethos of authenticity. And yeah, so that's an interesting, uh, an interesting time that that we're in, where the where the where the well, where there's much more and more suspicion, uh, but not yet fully a developed ethos of profilicity. Well, and that, I think that that sense of suspicion maybe um, is helping me bring out perhaps what an, another one of my my concerns is, or it's. It's just one of those intuitive things I feel about it that I think what might, I would say the proper word, scare people on some level about the idea of profilicity. Uh, and the reason I think why people are virtue signaling isn't just, you know, they're just arrogant and want to show off their virtue. A lot of times it is out of um, fear of being perceived in a negative way. And I think maybe people feel almost oppressed by, I mean, I don't mean it in a political sense, but uh, oh, burdened. They're worried about being the, the burden of, of a million eyes watching them all the time, the the judgment, standing in judgment of right. the general peer. Um, exactly. And I guess maybe the case you're making is that's the situation, whether you, you like it or not. Um, yes. So we'd better develop an ethos around it. But I think people will be motivated to, to cling on to the authenticity view out of the desire to basically not live in that world um, to, mm. <laughs> to say, no, I'm authentic and I'm not going to curate my profile right. to what you expect. Um, yes. I don't know if I have a question there, but <laughs> just yeah, that's sort of what I see happening. And right. it's definitely the case with, I think, Professor Peterson to some extent, as yes. I think you pointed yeah. out. Well, um, yeah. we're at about an hour. Um, do you have time for maybe one final question? Sure. Um, yeah. I it's a broad one, but uh, something I, I've taken to asking now. Um, how do you see the state of philosophy in twenty twenty one? Are you optimistic? Do you think uh, um, you know? Uh, just if you're surveying the global academy right now, what do you see? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, I think also there are major changes have uh, happened. And I think we come to see now if you have, like I do, uh, and I don't know about you, uh, background in academic philosophy. And we kind of thought, okay, that's kind of the natural home of philosophy, right? And but of course, that's historically not true, right? <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the, the, that philosophers were philosophy professors uh, having a job at a university. That's a very some of them lived phenomenon. in a barrel with dogs. So exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or they had all kinds of you know. But the, the, this kind of notion, of, uh, this kind of the, the existence of the philosopher as a university professor. Okay, Hegel. Uh, one of the first, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's kind of of the time when it started. And um, uh, but then even then, uh, many of the most interesting thinkers were not proper uh, professors, right? Whatever Wittgenstein was very much at the fringes of uh, academics, and uh, many others too. And then, or they weren't really in philosophy, like whatever Derrida. Or, now we have people like Zizek or Peterson, even right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and I think that's actually not a bad thing. I think it's uh, that philosophy moves. Uh, increasingly beyond the confines of the very much uh, limited academic system, right? Uh, that's I don't think the academic system is the natural home of philosophy. Mm. And um, uh, I mean, society always changes and thereby philosophy also al always changes. Um, and it doesn't have any natural home. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I personally, find it uh, very much from me liberating would be the wrong, wrong word. This is to ha having this YouTube channel, which came out, came about quite coincidentally. And um, that's much more, um, how to say, brings about much more resonance like that we are talking now, right? Mm -hmm. This is because 
uh, of, of my channel. And it's a great conversation that I've been enjoying a lot. And it would just not have been possible if I would have just be a, a mainstream it, or, or uh, not mainstream, I should take this back, if I had just been doing philosophy in the way the academic yeah. system is functioning. I have to justify what I'm doing because I'm, it's not really the part of my work, my job description, right? So mm -hmm. I'm always kind of worried a little bit about because my channel is monetized, but I'm paid uh, very well by my university, but then that's not really the job that I'm doing. So they can question, hey, why are you not, write, why are you not writing papers, right? You should write papers. <laughs> What's this channel that you're doing there, right? So, um, and we're seeing some something um uh, seeing something like this happening like i see it in my myself right uh how i i feel much more lively and uh, active and um empowered even uh as a philosopher outside of the proper academic structure so i think that's a very good thing at least yeah, for myself think... it's a very good thing I th I, not I think for money so. reasons. I mean, it's just for I feel I'm, I have the feeling I'm 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 doing much more actual philosophy than I I was I was able to uh, in, in the previous more, more strict setting. Yeah, the correspond the opportunity to correspond and engage with and um, yeah, you know, like you said, have conversations like this one, which the pleasure has been all of mine, Professor and. But yeah, I think it's a good thing. I don't know if it's an unmitigated good, but I don't know if you could say that about anything. Um, right. So, um, and uh, yes, and I'm, I am eternally grateful as you are that we have figures like Slavoj Zizek, um, who uh, <laughs> I think is in addition to a philosopher, a comedic genius. Um, exactly. Yes. <laughs> before wrapping up, uh, Professor Muller, um, would you like to plug? Uh, your book or tell people where they can find your book or find more about your work, anything of that. Yeah, nature? sure. I mean, of course I'm happy if anyone would like to read uh, uh, the book, you and your profile. Um, and yeah, it's, if, if you buy it, of course then you can buy it uh, and, uh, in the usual, uh, throughout the usual, the usual channels. Places. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Muller. And uh, we're signing off. Alrighty.